Good evening and welcome to the Politica podcast. Uh, tonight we have with us Dr. James Lindsay from uh, New Discourses. And uh, I, I've, been, I've been fascinated about a lot of this work you've been doing on critical race theory and critical theory in, in specifically, but I, I was kind of curious, how did you get from mathematics to, <laughs> to, to doing work there? You know, I always tell people I fell backwards into it. Um, as it turns out, you know, it's a little bit controversial. People still kind of recoil when I say this, but I actually got involved. After I finished my PhD, I left the university. I was unhappy with how the university was gearing towards student retention, uber alles, and, you know, just how do you keep students? Don't fail anybody. We had these faculty meetings telling us not to fail students, one F per class. And I thought, I teach mathematics. What are you talking about? You know, sometimes half the class fails. And so I didn't want to continue being a professor in those circumstances. I didn't realize at the time that it was creating conditions that were going to hold administrations hostage to the most, you know, whiny and uh, complaining students, which is kind of what bent the universities as far as they've gone now. But I wanted out. So I got involved in looking for an intellectual pursuit, what was called the New Atheism Movement. And it turns out the New Atheism Movement got woke in 2011, very early on. And so I watched that progression and started to look at the scholarship in gender studies uh, to try to figure out what was happening with this, you know, kind of hobby movement that I was kind of participating in. And uh, I started to learn about systemic sexism and misogyny because it was mostly the gender studies side of things and the idea that sex and gender are social constructions and all of this. And I said, what is this? And I dig deeper and then I run into critical race theory. The next thing you know, um, a colleague of mine, Peter Bogosian, and I decided these people are ripe for an academic hoax. They, we, could, we could submit a crazy paper to their academic journals. We could get that out there, and they wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And let's prove it. So we wrote this absurd paper um, called The Conceptual Penis as a Social Construct, where we said that penises don't really exist. They're socially constructed, but they cause all of our problems, especially climate change. And it got accepted by a borderline or fully predatory journal. And this created a bit of a scandal. We got a bit of attention, and then we thought, you know, maybe we should do this right. And so when we sat back and thought about it, we got a bunch of criticism. People told us, this is what you did wrong. This is what you'd have to do to prove your point. You know, all of these things. So we said, okay, there's a roadmap. Let's follow that. And so we started a couple of months later what's now known as the Grievance Studies Affair, where we wrote 20 papers, and we didn't submit anything to low-ranking journals if, unless we had to. We started out with the highest-ranking journals, you know, top journal of feminist philosophy, top journal of feminist geography, top journal of feminist sociology, down the line, critical race theory and education journals, and we just wrote as many papers as we could for a year, 20 of them. Seven of them were accepted, kind of proving our point that you could, what we ended up proving is you can't just make stuff up. You have to know what, what you're referencing. But you can start with your conclusion, and it can be as absurd as you want, and make the worst possible argument as long as you flatter political biases and you know kind of do the woke thing, and they'll accept it. One of our papers, which is about dog parks, <laughs> a kind of famous paper about the dog park, actually won an award from its journal, uh, for excellence in scholarship, saying this is what scholarship should look like. It was totally made up, totally preposterous and absurd, and it bore the conclusion that we should train men the way we train dogs so that we can minimize rape culture. So, I mean, just completely absurd stuff. By that point, though, it's like I tell people, you know, you buy a new property, you're cleaning up the house, you clean up the basement, you clean up the wood pile, but there's that tarp over there, and finally you pull up and what's under the tarp, and when we pulled up what's under the tarp, what's in this scholarship, it was dead bodies, it's the end of civilization. I remember going to my wife and saying, honey, this stuff is the end of the country, <laughs> the end of Western civilization if it keeps running rampant and I don't see anything stopping it. Can I quit my job and work on exposing this full time? And she said, I hope you can make money doing that. You have 18 months. And turned everything into just full-time critical theory, critical race theory study at that point. Now, the critical theory, that, that can't, comes out of the Frankfurt School, right? Right. Uh, and, uh, of course, Hegel was the kind of intellectual uh, impetus for some of it, right? right. Uh, just, well, people applying Hegel. 
right. who also inspired Karl Marx, right? right. Can, you, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between the critical theory and, say, Marxism? Well, sure. I mean, it's actually, there's a guy, Isaac Gotsman, who's an education theorist. Uh, he was at Indiana when he wrote a book called A Critical Turn in Education. I don't know if he's still there, but I assume he's still at, at Indiana. And he actually says that it's more accurate not to refer to critical theory as critical theory, which is what Max Horkheimer wanted to call it, but rather critical Marxism, to show that it's just a continuation of Marxism in a new vein, a new way of thinking about Marxist themes, Marxist ideology, but to um, kind of complicate it, or as they would say, nuance it. So what, what was going on, you know, Marxism was, Marx wrote in the 1840s, 1850s, and 1860s, and um, his ideas didn't really go anywhere until the Russian Revolution. You know, Lenin picked them up and was very successful, and there were many Marxists, but nothing was happening. His prediction that the workers' parties would come together and spontaneously form a proletarian movement that would take things over, just wasn't happening. And so Lenin ends up forcing it with his new vanguard model, uh, forces through the Bolshevik model, as it's also known, forces through a socialist revolution in Russia. So you have these Marxists in Europe scratching their heads saying, what in the heck happened? Marx said that the industrial centers would spontaneously go socialist, and that didn't happen. And then you have this peasant society that got forced in by a different method through this kind of warlord, political genius, megalomaniac in, in the person of Lenin. And they said something's wrong with Marxist theory. Marx must have been wrong about some of the details. His big picture, mostly right, but some of the details must be wrong. And so critical theory was born out of the idea that uh, they needed to re resolve how did that happen. Why, why is that the case? And what they figured out was that the cultural elements and the way that capitalism kind of they, they believe brainwashes people, uh, keeps capitalism in place in, in successful industrial centers to the point where they finally were saying things like, you know, the, the ideal society that Marx envisioned or communism can't even be comprehended or articulated in the existing language that we have today, the existing theory of society. You have to completely break from it. They, you know, got very out there. Um, and also to the point where they were saying, that, you know, Marx was wrong, that freedom and justice, he's, he said, that, you know, in communism, we'd have perfect justice and perfect freedom. But they said, no, these are, and this is Hegelian, they're, they're, they're dialectical concepts. They're in contradiction to one another. So that the more freedom you have, the less justice and vice versa. So they had this completely different approach and take on it coming through from the 1920s up through the 1950s or so. That it's this critical Marxism, which the goal of critical Marxism is to examine the existing society, uh, and hold it up against an idealized vision so that you say this is where it falls short. In fact, it calls this negative thinking. It's also a Hegelian idea where they only ever think in terms of the negative. How do you complain about this? How do you say this isn't good enough? How do you say this is falling short? This is who's being disenfranchised or alienated or exploited. Constant negative criticism of everything that exists. That's a Marx illusion. Uh, ruthless criticism of all that exists was, a, was one of Marx's famous injunctions. Uh, for how Marxism was to proceed. And then they said that you must hold up this idealized vision, complain about the existing society for not being ideal, and then uh, inspire social activists to go out and take to the streets and kind of turn things over. So critical theory was born to continue the Mar to carry the Marxist torch after Marxism failed. Uh, it's the short answer after all that, that long theory. Um, they had to pass the torch to a new vein of, of, of analysis, which was in mostly in culture, in the way that consumerism packages up culture, sells culture back to people. Uh, so capitalism becomes the big enemy, of course. The, the, you know, some cool cultural thing, music or whatever happens, capitalism figures out a way to commodify it, turn it into records, play it in dance clubs, put it on the radio or whatever, and sell it back to people so then it's no longer authentic. It's now just a piece of the, the capitalist machine that brainwashes people. So they wanted to get inside people's heads and look at things completely differently. And that was really a dominant strain of thought up until about the 1960s uh, when they switched to identity politics instead. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I noticed that there's several areas where this tried to be reborn too. I mean, of course, we've got Bell and the critical legal theory, yeah. right? But also this liberation theology that came yeah. out of... Uh, South America with uh, a lot of the Catholic priests. That's right. Of course, Obama's preacher, right? Jeremiah Wright, we all know him. Yes. Uh, I mean, that was his main thrust, right? 
Right. Well, and the connections to the current pope as well, uh, you know, in that regard. So, yeah, the liberation theology, a, lo a lot of the Marxists were very successful at infiltrating the Catholic Church in South America uh, in the 1950s and 60s, 40s, 50s and 60s. And liberation theology came out of that. Of course, there's the offshoot under James Cone, the black liberation theology uh, that kind of inspired this sort of, it's kind of the, the, the collision between um, the sort of Protest, evangelical Protestantism and liberation theology and critical race theory mixed kind of into one really ugly grab bag. Uh, but yeah, the, the theological move is actually very important because that actually became the conduit for where a lot of these theorists were able to get from South America to North America. Paulo Freire, for example, the Brazilian education theorist, who was just a Marxist. I mean, you read Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed, and he's like, Marx this. Lenin that, Mao this, he's just literally quoting these, he's Gramsci this, the other thing, it's just all pure Marxism. And how, do, how in the world did that penetrate into the North American educational and, and academic space? Well, priests, these liberation theology priests basically kind of had what we might look at as like a reverse underground railroad, bringing these guys and their ideas up into North America and getting them places where they could speak to the radical movements that were already happening in the U.S. in the 60s and 70s. You know, it's interesting to me thinking about uh, some of this. I, I, one of the books I read a long time ago that I thought was good was uh, De Tocqueville's D Democracy of an America. And, and uh, the, th the thing that I really got out of that book was De Tocqueville finally discovered why the system works here, uh -huh. right? And, and it was because of liberty, the principles of liberty, and, and, and although they had that in France, right, but the idea that government is not our God, yes. that people were beholden to a God above government, right? Right. And uh, it's, it's interesting when I look at this and the whole movement, the secularization of our society where today it seems like we do have a state religion. It's, and it, We do, yeah. You know, and, and it's not what most people would consider a religion. It's actually anti-religion, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, woke is now effectively the state religion. And if we could just get the Supreme Court to recognize that it bears every mark, both in the legal practical argument that they would require, but also in the theoretical or theological sense, that it is actually a religion. And if the state is endorsing it, uh, everything would change more or less overnight. But that's a that's kind of the you know, the holy grail argument to try to make is to try to get the Supreme Court to, to recognize all of this. Communism itself is all very religious. We, we go, have to go all the way back to Hegel to really understand why, but Hegel was trying to use his systematic philosophy to kind of reconceive of the idea of the Trinity so that it was now a dialectical concept instead of Father, Son, Holy Spirit as three co-eternal um, figures within the one deity. Now, Hegel says, no, you have this absolute idea, because he's an idealist, and that represents sort of the Father, but then he says the, divine, uh, uh, the, the state is the divine idea as it exists on earth. That's a direct quote from Hegel. The state is a divine idea as it exists on earth. Well, that's tantamount to the position of the Son in the Christian trinity. And then what, is, what does the state inspire? Well, it inspires a, a spirit of the people underneath that state, a geist, but that's obviously in the position of the Holy Spirit. And his belief was that eventually that Geist would create enough pressure. The people under that particular set of rules would create enough pressure to where they had all these new ideas burst forth. And then the idea would then shift. The contradictions of the existing society would shift the idea. And so you'd have a new father. So now you have father giving birth to son, giving birth to spirit, giving birth to father. And this kind of a not co-eternal God that is, but now there, as he actually dialectically framed it out, you now have a God that is becoming. And that's a very famous Hegel dialectic uh, point there. He said that, you know, being and nothing are opposites, so they're dialectical concepts, they're thesis and antithesis, but what makes them come together in synthesis was becoming. That which is must have become at some point. And so he now has a God, it's not a God that is, it's eternal and transcendent beyond everything, but rather a God that becomes. And how does it become? Through the life processes, or the vital life processes of man. In other words, thinking. Through speculation, as a matter of fact, because he's a speculative philosopher. 
which meant that you had to accord with his view of theory, which he, he called, a re it gets translated as reason, but in German it's Vernunft, which is this higher order level, it means theoretical understanding as opposed to you know empirical understanding, which is uh, Verstand in German. It's just understanding, it's low level. The theory is what makes it all make sense. So you can see that this is actually a you kind of a very robust fusion of, of epistemology and ontology and axiology, which means it's a theology, and a completely different framing of kind of the, the Christian picture. And then Marx picks this up and says, no, 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 Hegel has this standing on its head. If man is to be independent, man has to be man in himself. He can't be a child of God. He can't be a product of the idea. No, it all starts at the state. So the state becomes the God figure. And man in himself must cut all ties. He must cut ties from, from God, and he must cut ties from nature. So if you wanted to be even a natural law theorist or even a deist like many of the founders of the U.S., you're still, st uh, with Marx, you're still stuck. He says, no, we've got to sever all those ties. Man has to become man in himself. So now for Marx, he elevates into the position of the father as man himself, man in himself. And then in the position of the son remains the state. And then... The, the spirit is determined for him by material conditions. What happened when we shifted in the 1920s to the 1950s into cultural Marxism uh, is they then shifted the position to where, oh, well, we're going to focus on that spirit side of things, the cultural side of things. But there was also the shifting back that Marx was too reductionist, that Marx was too mechanical uh, in his approach. So now we're going to be very strong culturalists in our, our arguments, and that's more nuance as they would have it. And so you can see that this same religious architecture that stretches all the way back to the phenomenology of spirit in 1807 is just rolling right through. It's a dialectical religion that believes that you will get to a utopia on earth if and only if human beings resolve all the contradictions one by one and through successive revolutions. And there's all kinds of, Hegel would love it, there's all kinds of puns there with revolution. It means going around that right. spiral. Right. But it also means having a literal, the, the, the idea gives birth to a state, gives birth to a, a spirit. The spirit hits its peak level of contradiction. This is what Marx said. That's when material conditions switch. It's a peak level of contradiction. And then there's a revolution. And what was Marx's whole theory? It's a revolutionary theory. And so you can see that this is actually a religion. It just got identity politics grafted onto it in the 1960s because that's where all the radical energy was, and critical race theory was born out of that milieu. And it, so it's just the same religion using race instead of class instead of speculative idealism. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, another uh, it, most people would relate to Hegel as the as the father of secular humanism, right? Mm -hmm. But this is basically the same principle. And you know, it, it amazes me that that people really haven't picked up on this. They, d they don't understand that. that I, I, I like to say that de Tocqueville was, was a genius because he saw what the U.S. had become. That's right. right. Yeah. Um, you know, also Locke, because Locke understood that in order to have that freedom, because de Tocqueville said that is the, that's the magic ingredient. Right. Another word for it, it's kind of a popular word today, it's not exactly the same, but it's actually decentralization of power, divided powers, um, you know, checks and balances that come into play, whether it's the three, uh, three levels of the government that, that are all checking and balancing one another uh, constantly, whether it's that we're having multiple political parties that have different views. I know the founders weren't big fans of political parties, but the, you know, left and right, each kind of having a party that they're home to gives a check and a balance ideologically. That freedom is core to, it is the magic ingredient that makes things work. We saw in the, the you know, late 19th century, the concentration of power in these big corporations and the trusts, and it was causing misery, it was causing problems, because the, com the corporations acting together were able to act in a sense like a de facto state because they'd gained too much power. Well, what made what broke us free of that? Well, we did antitrust laws. All of a sudden, the economy can start to go uh, free again, and it starts to boom. So this decentralization, this this freedom to do as you will with your property, do as you will with your ideas, is really the magic ingredient that makes America work. And de Tocqueville saw that correctly, but Locke understood, and that's of course what inspired Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence. Uh, he understood that you can't possibly have freedom of that kind unless you secure at least three liberties. You must secure the liberty 
of life. You can't be killed for having the wrong views or misusing your property unless you know it's to cause harm to other people. You must have the the fundamental liberty of, of or freedom of liber- or right to liberty, which is that they can't imprison you for having the wrong ideas or or, or holding your own property, as you will. And then finally, he, his third was property itself, because if they can take away your ability to live in you know, at least modest comfort and to eat, then they can control you. So he saw that life, liberty, and property become the three key things. Of course, Jefferson rephrased property in the pursuit of happiness, but that's actually following Locke's philosophy on what property really means. Is that It's what allows you to pursue happiness on your terms. And so when you, when you see those very foundational ideas, you can see that um, those are exactly the things that the kind of Marxists all the way through want to get rid of. What did Marx say communism is? It's the abolition of private property. He says that in the second chapter of the Communist Manifesto. Why? Because if they can control property, they can control you. Right. And of course, then Ma- Mao says power flows from the barrel of a gun. So life is cheap. Right. And liberty, of course, the, whether it's the gulags, whether it's concentration camps, whether it's whatever else, they're perfectly in ha- perfectly happy to imprison or s- cart off to Siberia or whatever else, people who disagree with them. So they understand, Locke understood that this is the key to freedom, and Tocqueville understood that the freedom is the magic ingredient that creates the giant positive-sum game that is Western civilization. And so when you, when you look at this and you see that it's being systematically undermined, um, you've got a real, you, you get a real sense of the problem that's on our hands. You know, that, that, that uh, brings up uh, a, a concept that I'd like to talk about, that life is not a zero-sum game, right? And, and you know, when you, when, when you view things from the lens of Marx, there's a fixed pie. So if, if somebody gets a bigger slice, they could only do that at the expense of somebody else. Right. Right. And, and that's why there's all of this goings on now about, you know, how the rich have taken too much. And uh, but, you know, Adam Smith noticed something a lot different. And that was that a single person uh, could actually gain without outside of taking from others. Right. Right. That you could, you know, he saw this pin factory and the idea that you could actually produce more than you could consume, yes. right? And, you know, the old philosophy that you had to rape and pillage, right, in order to gain wealth, and, you know, you had to go gather gold from all over the world, uh, is no longer true, right? Right. You, know, the, you can actually work and produce something, you know, as you said, more than you can consume. You can actually create something of value to other people, and then what kicks in, you know, as an economist, you'll you'll probably grin in your heart, is the law of comparative advantage comes in immediately, right. and all of a sudden you develop a positive sum game. Right. Yeah. I I I, I really wish people could understand that principle a little bit better. But you know, back to this, you know, the secular humanist and and uh, you know this whole philosophy. Mike Lee once said that it's as if the devil himself wrote this stuff. I, I hesitate to, to go quite so theological, but it's pretty close to that. It is. It's an actual. It's actually an inversion of everything that works. It's an inversion of the good. Um, and when you have an inversion that's being brought in by deception, and in particular linguistic deception, uh, you know, changing the meanings of words, a big famous one within Marxism, a lot of people don't even know this, is the word democracy. For a communist, somebody who believes in communism, It's not possible to have a democracy if people are unequal. If you have more money than I do, or more privilege in today's lingo, whatever it happens to be, then you have more voice than I do. So we don't have equality between us, so we don't have a democracy. Your vote is, your ability to influence people and influence votes is bigger than mine. And so we don't have a real democracy. So for a communist, there is no democracy outside of communism. And so they have these linguistic manipulations. So they believe this about democracy, and then they'll come out and say, well, this strikes at the very heart of our democracy. And you hear that a lot on the news from Democratic politicians, especially lately. This strikes right at the heart of our democracy. And then you have to ask, well, what do you mean by that? Do we only have a, a democracy truly if we have perfect equity where everybody has everything, whether it's material uh, equity, so they have their, you know, everybody's made equal like socialism, or whether it's cultural equity, 
so everybody's had their privilege redistributed till it's all equal. It, do they mean that that's the only way that we have in a, a democracy? So when, when Democratic politicians, for me, come up and speak, I get very nervous when they start talking about how we must defend our democracy. I saw one of these guys saying something about the vaccine mandates being shut down in the courts or whatever. That This is a threat to our democracy, and I'm thinking— what do you mean by that? But what, that's all certainly tangential. not what we mean, <laughs> right? But that's the thing: is the the Bible even names the devil as the deceiver, right? Right, with a capital D. And so, if you have something that's the inversion of the good, the inversion of the natural order, the inver- inversion of God's law, putting man in himself as the center of all things, and then you you, you move that ideology through willful deception. That it's so sophisticated a lot of times that I say willful. Some people know they're doing it. Marx was no doubt an intellectual swindler. He said, in fact, at one point, if, when you notice the contradictions, don't question me. In some of his very early writings, he knew he was a swindler. But a lot of the people pick this up, and they have no idea. They've been deceived and then go out to deceive. That You want to call that? If, if anything deserves to be called, the devil himself wrote this. That's that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, that kind of hit me when Mike Lee used that expression because I thought about a lot of these issues. People, people also don't see how this is a real attack on religious liberty. It is. Right? Yeah. And it, it's on every level. Um, communists, of course, are famously no fan of religious liberty. They want to have an enforced you know, atheist state, but I would actually say they're more of an enforced... Um, I don't know exactly how to characterize it because they, they hold up the state as as the deity. Right. So it's not technically atheist. And also if you're openly rebelling against something, you can't rebel against something intentionally that you know or that you believe doesn't exist. Right. So if you, right. you can't rebel against it if you don't believe it. So it's right. not atheist in the I don't believe sense. It's atheist in the rejection what some people used to call anti-theism. Um, so y- you... You have to understand that the, that religious liberty is at threat, but simultaneously what's actually happening is through things like liberation theology, for example, and as it creeps into other faiths, is the perversion of every faith system on the planet so that they become kind of this giant ecumenical uh, heresy, really, uh, whether it's LDS, whether it's Catholics, whether it's Southern Baptist Convention, whether it's Muslims, whether it's uh, Zen Buddhists. What they're going to do is go inside, change the meanings of the language, change the phrasing. What does it mean to love your neighbor? You know, they're going to go in and manipulate what that means for people until you have this woke religion being preached in Catholic words in Catholic churches, in Protestant words in Protestant churches, in Mormon words in Mormon churches, and Muslim words in, uh, in, in, in mosques, and in Jewish words in synagogue. But it's going. It's all going to be this other thing, this equity religion, this redistribute everything religion to put man in himself. What is your identity? The endless focus on identity. It's no longer you know made in the image of God or an image bearer of God in the Imago Dei. It's now. It's now. Who am I in terms of this social group and that social group and this social group and how is that defined in terms of these power dynamics that this theory has put forth. So there's this huge push to reshape every faith to profess one and only one new belief. And when you realize that, you have no religious liberty at all if all of your faiths are all just being retooled to preach in different words the same catechism. Yeah. that We're going to take a break, and uh, we'll be right back. Thank you. Hi. I'm James Lindsay. I'm an author. I'm the founder of New Discourses, and I am a leading uh, expert in critical race theory. I would like to introduce you to a book that I have coming out soon called Race Marxism, where I go through the history of critical race theory and explain how uh, the theorists that that devised it were able to remake Marxism from an economic theory into a racial theory. Uh, That should be coming out soon. It's not available quite yet. Uh, In the meantime, you can keep track of me and uh, follow what I'm doing and see my other work on my website at newdiscourses.com where I put out as much information about critical theory, critical race theory, and the movement that's challenging America right now uh, as I can, as quickly as I can. So I hope to see you there. Welcome back to the uh, Politica podcast. Uh, We have James Lindsay today and and, uh, the book Race Marxism. Uh, Why don't you tell us a little bit about 
what this is about and you know tie it into your website and sure um so for the last several years i've been studying critical race theory and i'll just confess i spent a long time resisting the conclusion that it's marxism dressed up in racial clothes and finally by reading and reading and reading i finally just was overwhelmingly convinced that the simplest way to understand what critical race theory is is race marxism but obviously this is going to require a little bit of an argument to, to, to unpack and make sure everybody understands. So I started this summer and I've written the manuscript for a book called Race Marxism that should come out soon uh, that details, begins with, you know, how do we define critical race theory? What is it? You know, and then what does it believe? Where does it come from? So it goes into neo-Marxism and critical theory and postmodernism and all of the cultural Marxism before that. Well, where did that come from? Marx, Hegel, Rousseau, and then dipping in a little bit with W.B. Du Bois, who was a, a black, he's the first PhD from Harvard, a black PhD from Harvard uh, in 1897 or something. He got his PhD around about there. And he wrote famously The Souls of Black Folk in, in 1903, which is considered to be the first critical race theory book by most critical race theorists. And then I talk about what it does, and I talk about some stuff we can do about it. So race Marxism should come out soon. It is the, I think, the definitive word on the fact that critical race theory is Marxism dressed up as race. It all started because I was going to do a seminar for my company, New Discourses, which is at newdiscourses.com, uh, where I put out this information as fast as I can learn it, uh, whether it's about you know the neo-Marxists or, or critical race theorists or whoever else. Uh, but I was doing a seminar series on what critical race theory is and where it comes from, and I said, you know, I should just turn this into a book. And in the process of nailing down all the research, I just completely convinced myself that this is literally just Marxism that's retooled itself, using race instead of class as the, uh, the kind of the, the fulcrum for the lever to kind of open society up. Class was the lever for Marx, race is the, the lever for the critical race theorists. So that should be coming soon. Uh, it, I think is, is the last thing I really need to say about critical race theory, but I'm happy to keep talking about right. it. Right. Well, you know, a lot of people don't draw that uh, draw that similarity. You know, if you're talking about uh, the proletariat class versus the bourgeoisie, yeah. uh, and and then you look at the oppressor versus the oppressed, right? What what really is the difference? I mean, exactly. And so that's I mean, this is I think the key piece. And as far as I know, I uncovered this. Maybe some other people have talked about it, but I haven't seen it. Uh, and certainly nobody prominently has been talking about it except maybe Jordan Peterson around the edges. But what had happened was in the 1960s, um, the kind of chief neo-Marxist of the era, Herbert Marcuse, was writing. And he said, well, we got a problem. Capitalism has stabilized the working class. And he says openly in, in an essay on liberation, which he wrote in 1969, he says openly, we need a new working class. Where is it? It's in the racial minorities. It's in the sexual minorities. It's in the feminists. It's in the unemployed. It's in the, the societal outcasts and outsiders, by which he really meant kind of the radical new left that was blowing things up. And he said, and then we need a student movement that kind of shepherds them. So we have to get into the universities. And so this new left became the academic left, and its goal was to start shepherding a new identity politic uh, with Marxist critical theory at its heart. And so what you had was what I call this the birth of identity Marxism. And then that after the postmodern and post-structuralist turn of the 80s and 90s became very culturally focused again, uh, started to see races and sexualities as cultural identifiers. And it kind of became a cultural identity Marxism. And critical race theory is the race variant of that. And so this is kind of the history that that book tells. And people hesitate to say, oh, it's Marxism because, you know, it's about economic class. It's very rigid. There's this and, and the other thing. And then this critical race theory is very diffuse and it's cultural and it's complicated and it's nuanced. And it talks about things within the civil rights movement or tries to co-opt them is a better way to put that. And it's the nature that, that's what people don't understand is we, we already talked about Hegel. We already talked about Marx. All of this, the continuity in all of this is the dialectical method, which basically means that it can pick up contradictory things and cobble them together into some new thing. So it did pick up a little bit of classical liberalism. It did pick up a little bit of postmodernism, which had actually rejected Marxism for the most part. It did pick up neo-Marxist ideas. It did pick up just radical identity politics. It kind of it's like the it's like one of those sticky balls and you know your kids play with it and it rolls across the carpet and now it's got hair and everything else stuck to it dog hair or whatever uh 
it's like one of those. It's picked up everything it can that's useful to it. Um, kind of a, a huge gain of function program right? for yeah. Marxism. And the goal was how do we break open America? And they race with critical race theory is obviously how you're uh, the most sensitive spot. They knew that would be the most sensitive spot given our history and given the, the, you know, the open contradictions that people like Jefferson struggled with when he was writing things like the Declaration of Independence, when he presided and so on. You know, he, he held slaves, but he wanted to abolish slavery. And he literally regretted, if you, you know, read biographies of Jefferson and read his writings, he regretted to the day he died uh, that he was kicking the can down the road to a later generation, which is, of course, if you know anything about Jefferson, giving a problem to the next generation was the thing he was the most afraid of and the least willing to do. And so they were able to take that history and then kind of co-opt pieces of it and cobble all of these things together so that they can now pretend that they're the proper inheritors of the civil rights movement when, in fact, they pervert it, and that they're the proper inheritors of the you know liberal progressive tradition when, in fact, they pervert it and turn it more and more Marxist. So people need to read a lot of very difficult stuff through the 1960s to kind of understand how this giant shift happened. And that's kind of what I'm trying to bring to the table with this book and the research I've been doing for the last year. Very good. I, I, I'm, I'm interested in reading that. Uh, uh, fascinating looking at this stuff. You know, back, back to Jefferson, you know, and the whole slavery idea and kicking the... Uh, I, I used to... I, I, I like to say that, you know, pin the words, all men are created equal, and four score and seven years later, right. Lincoln made us a more perfect union. That's right. That's right? right. And uh, But everything was set in place that allowed that to happen. Right, yeah, that's the, that's the piece that gets ignored by critical race theory. They say they teach honest history, but they, they don't teach honest history. They ignore the fact that exactly that phrase is what set in motion, and then you know the architecture that was built around that Declaration of Independence set in motion the, the ability to move into a post-slavery world, even though America wasn't the first on the scene to achieve it, to, to abolish slavery. It was, the same, it was those ideas as they spread to our, our allies in Europe, for example. And slavery still even exists today where American ideals have not been taken up. It's not like we live in this perfect world the right ideas were put down and the practical considerations you know were difficult and this is of course just a point of exploitation that these kinds of critical complaining theories latch onto they say oh well they're just hypocrites no they weren't hypocrites they had a vision for something they had no idea how to manifest in reality given what was happening and because people like Jefferson weren't exactly heavy-handed statists who were just gonna slam their fist on the table and say it's this way now deal with it you know you don't which is what they would be we're just going to change all the rules now everybody's going to do everything exactly together now this is the new rule that's the way that, that these kind of radical leftists think about the world so they look back at jefferson and say well he didn't do that it's just because he's a hypocrite he secretly wanted to keep it going and that's the kind of cynical analysis that can eat at somebody who's you know feeling alienated or dispossessed or upset or whatever and it, so it's just poison they, you know, it's it's interesting. A lot of a, a lot of these theorists go back uh, to Martin Luther King, and they said that, uh, you know, that he was bought off in some ways, right? Yeah. But but he he understood that the very phrase "all men are created equal" was the impetus. That's right. For his success. That's right. He called it a promissory note, and it said that it was time for the United States to make good on that promissory note. You promised all men are created equal let's have it, you know, let's end uh, segregation and Jim Crow, let's end the, end all of this actual racial oppression that was going on, let's live up to those words. And, you know, the theorists, the critical race theorists love to bring up the more radical works and more radical and more frustrated statements of Martin Luther King. And he was a complicated guy with a lot of views, you can't really dismiss that. And he had frustrated moments and he had kind of better moments. But his legacy as the titan of American history that he is, regardless of anything bought off, personal issues, whatever, the legacy is all caught up in I Have a Dream, which they hate. They say that this is, you know, white people only like that part of him. Well, look at Jefferson. Here we are talking about Jefferson. We don't have to lionize Thomas Jefferson, though. He had some terrible ideas. His idea, for example, that the Constitution should be rewritten every 19 years, 
and then he sold the Navy so that because he said, oh, we don't need the Navy anymore, and we need to pay off our debt. So he sells the Navy during his, his first term, or at the beginning of his second term, I think. He sells the Navy. Whoops, then Napoleon starts his wars, and all of a sudden we need a Navy, so he has to build a new one. You know, we remember these people for their, the gems of their contribution to the, to the good, and they have lots of other views that we can study and think about and consider, but we don't have to, you know, if we're going to teach honest history, we don't have to lie about these characters. Yeah, Martin Luther King had a lot of things going on in his personal life. Martin Luther King had a lot of frustrated moments. He had a, Birmingham jail would be, I'd be very frustrated too. Right. And, you know, he's frustrated with the white liberal that's not picking up his share and doing his, his part. And that's a big critical race theory theme is like focus on the white liberal. Why? Because it's easy to twist the thumb screws on them. That's why the moral thumb screws and get them to do what you want. But he also stood at the front of the national mall and he gave that speech and he told us about his dream. And there's a reason everybody remembers the dream that his children are going to be judged by the content of their characters, by who they are. And, you know, we could add the merit of what they do with their talents that's how we're going to judge people in this country. We're not going to look at the color of skin. We're not going to care that much about your sexuality. We're not going to care that much about if you're a man or a woman in terms of what can you bring to the table, what can you do. That's who are you. That's what matters. And that's his legacy. And the critical race theorists are stuck having to not like that. But they're, they're able to kind of try to agitate with this idea, this false idea that we lionize you know, this one character, but then ignore everything else. No, we, 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 we lift up the best idea that he had. Like we lift up the best idea of Jefferson and kind of, you know, that constitution thing wasn't that 19 year thing. Wasn't that smart. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, 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 you know, I, I, as you were talking, I was thinking back to our national motto, E Pluribus Unum, That's right? right. Out, out, out of many one, it seems like the focus with this group, today is in divisions not in unity that's right and even the marxists the old 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 guard marxists hate critical race theory for that they have a saying that they give which is it's supposed to be race or it's just, it's supposed to be workers of the world unite not races of the world divide that's how they criticize critical race theory so even old school marxists see this um it's funny having more common cause with old school economic marxists than you know with a lot of kind of progressive liberals who think you know that they, they understand what's going on but this is it's very dividing they also fail to understand you mentioned e pluribus unum they talk about diversity equity and inclusion constantly that's their right. program that's already the best diversity equity and inclusion program and i hate i hesitate on the word equity well, I'll, I'll explain that's ever been laid out in the country or in the world in the world history of the world many people coming together acting as one people diversity is built in you, you're, you know, you become a naturalized citizen of the United States or you're born here as a citizen of the United States, you're included. Everybody's included. You're on your own, kid. Right. You know, so it's got diversity and inclusion. What about equity? The equity, the trick is equity means two things. For what, what they tell us it means is equality of access. And that's E Pluribus Unum gives you that. Right. It's the best you can do for that. What they actually mean in reality, though, is equality of outcome. Right. And the, the, the trick is, if you want to know how they do it, they only talk about access. They never talk about outcomes. But what they do is they measure outcomes and say if the outcomes are different, then the access must have been messed up somehow. Even Kennedy says that explicitly. He has this bad idea to have a constitu anti-racist constitutional amendment he wrote about in 2019 for Politico magazine. And he says explicitly that the, one of the guiding principles of this constitutional amendment that he wants is going to be that inequity or differences in outcomes by racial category is going to be taken as proof of discrimination. So he's telling you the interpretive frame that they use and they, they want to force everybody to use. So that's a terrible frame, though. There's lots of reasons things might come out differently, not just one variable. And so they want to, you know, nail it down to just that one. So this is how they trick you on equity. But, they, you know, this diversity, equity, and inclusion, we already have that in the United States. It's called e pluribus unum. It's part of the huge success. We brought in more immigrants from more places and put them together into this kind of magic melting pot that created so much you know, innovation, so much success, so much opportunity for so many people. And basically, the deal was, you show up, you want to be an American, you say you're, you, you, know, you become an American, you're an American, you're one of us now, let's do it together, regardless of where you came from and who you are. Not to say that, I mean, I know I'm 
smoothing over some of the ugly, you know, fights and arguments that have persisted through history that are less now, but still persist. But that's still the big picture. If you zoom out just enough to get away from the ugly nitty gritty, that's always been the big picture here. So e pluribus unum is, is, is the thing. Well, you know, uh, let's let's move on just a little bit into. I I hear this all the time. The press, you know, I I'm I'm a member of the Utah State Senate, and uh, I've been looking at these issues a lot. The press like to play this Jedi mind trick, and they say uh, we, we don't teach critical race theory, Ugh. right? The critical race theory is not in our schools. And then, right after they say that, they talk about equity and inclusion and diversity mm-hmm. and privilege and privilege right and and i i don't i don't fully understand how they're separating those things i i guess my my only comeback would be maybe they really don't understand what it is okay so that's possible it is possible that they don't understand what it is i find this very frequently that people will criticize and tell me that i don't know what critical race theory is and i'll find out that they've read none of the books None of the papers. They they don't. But you know, I've disagreed with it, so I must not understand what it is. The trick that's being employed there is that nobody is stepping into say a fourth grade classroom and sitting down and teaching race racism in American law from Derrick Bell in 1970. Nobody's having a kid read Faces at the Bottom of the Well, Derrick Bell from 1992. Nobody's having them read Kimberly Crenshaw. They're not teaching the formal theory. So kind of an analogy would be. But imagine you have a teacher in a classroom and they have the kids pray and they have the kids, you know, take the sacrament or whatever. You know, all the different things that you would associate with with Christianity. They're telling the parables out of whether it's the gospel or the Old Testament. They're telling all these kinds of things. But they never actually say, this is Christianity and here's what Christian theology says and here's the catechism. They never do the, the formal stuff. So they're not teaching Christianity. They're just implementing it. Right, and everybody would recognize immediately that that that's still teaching Christianity in the public school. The same thing's happening here. They're not teaching the theory as a theory. They're just implementing its ideas. They're teaching kids to think, and this is what critical race theory is actually about: is to get kids to th- or get people to think through a racial lens that sees race in terms of power and privilege. That's it. They call it a critical consciousness of race. So what they're doing is getting kids to think, oh, there is racial privilege. Racial privilege is important. Well, sorry, that's critical race theory. That the, This separates people into a privileged category who is oppressing by their very nature of being the other racial categories that are, that are, are being oppressed. That's critical race theory. So they're just implementing the ideas without teaching the formal theory. So that's the little trick. We're not teaching critical race theory as an academic subject like you might read in a survey course in a university or in grad school. They are instead just implementing its ideas and using the framing that critical race theory brings to everything. And in fact, they're doing it not just in some, you know, now it's time for critical race theory lesson. It's just infused into every lesson. It would be the same with the kind of religious analogy if, you know, when it's time for math class, you know, we're going to say, you know, two plus two equals what? God said four, you know. And right. so you're just infusing that into it. You know, why Why is the moon so bright in science class? Why, you know, well, it reflects the light of the earth just like God ordained. You know, it's, right. they're still, they're just infusing it without ever saying this is Christianity that we're teaching. So that's their little linguistic shell game that they're playing there. Um, which is either born out of ignorance or deception. Yeah, it's interesting that, uh, you know, I've, I've had talks with our state school board superintendent, and uh, she tells me that, you know, critical race theory is not in our schools, and then she starts talking about the portrait of graduate, yeah. social-emotional learning, and uh, that is so infused with critical race theory Yeah, that I, I don't know how they can say one thing and and mean a different i don't know and i i I can't call any specific person a liar without right much time but there's there there's a level we go back to that idea we talked about earlier that the heart of this whole thing is deception and you can be deceived and be honest and still repeat a lie or you could be the person doing the deceiving so it's it's very difficult to accuse anybody of having deceptive intentions but the truth is, whether it's 
through not understanding what's happening or through understanding what's happening and being malicious, both of which are bad, uh, mendacious, I should say, both of which are, are, are inexcusable. One is negligence and one is uh, like academic or intellectual negligence and one is, 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 is lying. Both of those things are, are possible explanations, but there are no other possible explanations. So, so what, what advice would you give me as a legislator into how, how to move away from this philosophy that's, that's really anti-American? It's anti-constitu- our Constitution, right? It's, it's, it's really going against the, the ideals that Jefferson had or you know, even looking at uh, Locke or... Uh, uh, de Tocqueville, you know. Right. So you, you, you really have to be uh, cautious and smart about your approach. You have to actually go after what critical race theory does rather than saying, oh, we're just going to ban critical race theory and ideas from critical race theory. Because the other little game they'll play then is they'll say, well, here's this idea in critical race theory that's totally banal. And everybody would see that it's valuable and important to consider. Things used to be very racist or you know something like this, and this benefited white people. And they'll say, well, historically, that's absolutely true, and we absolutely should teach that this is the way things were, maybe in, say, 1930 or whatever, or 1830. Uh, and so they'll bring up something like that. So you can't just say, oh, we're just going to exclude all critical race theory ideas, because what it is is it's actually a, it's like a lens for, for viewing different things, So what you actually for, for viewing everything. And so what you actually have to do is you have to, to, to ban what it does. You have to say, you know, we're not going to scapegoat upon racial lines. So if whiteness is critical to your argument, that's scapegoating on racial lines. We're not going to scapegoat on racial lines. We don't do that in American schools or Utah schools. We're not going to stereotype and rely heavily on stereotypes to understand identity categories. Um, we're not going to discriminate. You know, you have to go through and say, what does it do? We're not going to separate children by race, sex, gender, et cetera, and put them into various caucuses. Uh, as far as SEL goes, social emotional learning, which is it's a vehicle that includes things like critical race theory and the comprehensive sex education and queer theory, but it's kind of its own monster too. You know, I would tell you one of the most important things is that it is absolutely not the role of a teacher in any public school and in non-therapeutic environment, namely a classroom, to be doing psychological uh, counseling, which is what it amounts to. It's not their role. It's not their duty. Uh, They're not licensed to do it. It's not a therapeutic space. Uh, Teachers should not be practicing psychology on groups of children in uncontrolled environments. Uh, They also should, you know, be sticking to teaching, you know, the basics in in rigorous ways. So the other thing is you're also going to have to inspire um, transparency, so that people know what's actually being taught. So you can have watchdog groups that are looking and seeing what's happening. Transparency is their worst enemy. Uh, people keeping an eye on it. Yeah, saying, people, pe- people ask me how we, how we chase out this. And I said, well, it's like chasing out darkness. You shine, shine light, light on it. Shine light on it. That's right. Yeah. That's right. They, transparency is, is absolutely a cornerstone. So curriculum transparency, uh, I would say, is an important legislative Maneuver. Uh, Texas attempted to do some of this, and people lost the, the, the people pushing critical race theory lost their mi- their minds over it, which means they really don't want transparency. Uh, you see these cases with parents that are trying to do uh, public records requests or freedom of information requests, and when they attempt them, schools there was just one in the news recently where the school is trying to ask for like nine hundred and something thousand dollars to as a fee to deliver the the documents. Uh, sometimes the schools or the school boards sue the parents who are asking for information. So mandating transparency in curriculum, I think, is something, first, very important, and secondly, that's going to resonate very strongly with parents. Uh, and ultimately, though, you have to provide pathways for um, fairly harsh accountability. Uh, that's the hard part of this, which is, you know, we want to be nice, and we want to be kind people, but when people are abusing their power, especially when that, that power is being abused in the direction of our children, there have to be very, very stiff penalties, losing teacher licensure, uh, losing the ability to teach. How do you get around the fact that teachers get tenured? I mean, you take away their teaching license. Uh, those kinds of penalties. Financial penalties are, are significant as well, um, but they're not 
as effective because there are very large grant giving organizations that will help fill in in a lot of cases. So penalties that remove people from positions of power that they're abusing are, are very important. Uh, you also are going to have to clean up the education colleges. Colleges of education are, you know, they say the fish rots from the eye. The colleges of education are the eye. That's the thing that the 60s radicals figured out after they tried blowing things up and everybody hated them. That's the thing they figured out. If you want to take over the society, that's what we take over, teaching colleges, colleges yeah, of education. You, you know, it's, it's interesting that this, this is a point that I, that I try to make all the time with my colleagues is that unless we go after higher ed, we're not going to be able to do anything. And, and, you know, my whole point there is back, back to what you were saying, transparency for one. Yeah. If you're going to teach a class using the lens of critical race theory, then you need to tell students that's what it is. That's right. And I, I don't think uh, students, especially studying education that are going to be the teachers in our schools, should be forced to take these classes. No, in fact, it's a huge scandal and a huge problem. There are no alternative pathways in most states that are of any significance to license or, or accreditation. You have to go through these Marxist programs to become a teacher. So all alternative pathways, whether it's through religious education or just some other form of, of, of you know, educational, I feel silly saying educational education, but right. teacher college. Um, some other pathway to licensure and accreditation has to be secured uh, because right now, if you just rely on the universities and in particular the, the colleges of education, they are to a school corrupted beyond corrupt. And so even transparency there, you have this, this bottleneck where every teacher, whether they believe it or not, has to at least, you know, pretend to agree with this stuff to get their license to become a teacher, that has to change as well. Breaking open the accreditation and licensure uh, field so that there are, you know, robust alternatives to just the one so, so we can get the competition to come into play. Uh, the Marxist schools will lose out tremendously. You know, the other thing I was thinking about with higher ed too is the, the, the idea that students have the right to disagree. Yes. Um, I had a young lady come by my office and in, in tears, actually, she's studying to be a teacher. And uh, she went through a class. In class, they had this thing they called the privilege walk, right? Yep. Where, where they, you know, this massive intersectionality thing where they divide the class and then the, the privileged people are on the front row. Yeah. And uh, they were asked to, to write an essay. She wrote an essay about her privilege basically saying that uh, she thought it was hogwash, basically, yeah. right? And uh, the teacher, you know, it, it was very well-written yeah. paper. She read the paper to me. And uh, the teacher did give her a good grade on it. But uh, the, the next day in class uh, used her as an example of white fragility. Oh, wow. And, and, and explaining, he, he, they didn't point her out specifically, right? But read her paper. Right. And, uh, and uh, she just w was at a loss as to what to do, right? Because she wants to be a teacher. She knows she has to go through the steps. Right. And uh, it, that was a difficult thing for me to answer because, you know, she needs that credential. Right. Right. But, but it, made me, it made me even more resolved to try to do something. Yeah, something ha that, that's these kind of, um, I don't know a better way to put it, these malice techniques that a lot of these professors have adopted like that, that's a, that's a shaming technique is what that was. Even if nobody knew technically that it was her paper, um, she did. And she's now put on the spot. And, you know, of course, students are going to talk. Well, and the, and the rest of the class uh, is now sent a signal that they better that's, not make the same argument. Exactly. Right? Well, if, actually, if they, were, <laughs> if they were patriots, they would know that they all need to make that same argument tomorrow. Uh, but... No, that's th these tactics need to be. Um, there needs to be some some pathway provided. I don't know what that looks like, but there needs to be a, a pathway provided for people who are getting bullied um, by their professors or bullied by their administration for having heterodox views to what they've now established as the orthodoxy of the schools. Uh, that's crucial. I mean. Every one of us looks back at the story, you know, with Galileo and, and how he challenged the Catholic Church and, you know, ends up in their house arrest for this. We all look back at this as kind of one of those hero stories of history that he stuck by his guns and, you know, turned out he was speaking the truth. Uh, 
And we look back at the, the Catholic Church as the villain in that case, trying to persecute him in that regard. Uh, and so the same thing's happening again now, but it's the universities have taken the place of the corrupted church instrument that's now enforcing an orthodoxy on people. So it's the same fight that was happening 400 yeah, that, years that, ago. That camel slipped under the tent, the head of the camel, that's right. right? That's exactly right. And, uh, you know, my daughter, my daughter's a student at BYU, and uh, they showed a, 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 a video in class, and, and uh, the teacher said she didn't want to take any questions. And, and uh, But the next day in class, the teacher said, so uh, any comments on our on our video and my daughter nobody was saying anything my daughter stood up and she said that's critical race theory mm. and she said uh talked about systemic racism that i'm born a racist she said that's that's counter to the doctrine of our church yeah right right and uh that's that's akin to being the original sin that that you can't be forgiven of right yes, that's right so now now you've eliminated christ from the picture Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, I don't, I don't understand why this even belongs at, at Brigham Young University. Oh, it doesn't. <laughs> and, and, uh, and uh, you know, it, it's, it's interesting how, how the very idea of learning and questioning is basically cut off. Oh, right. Right? Some of my colleagues in the Senate, when we were arguing our resolution on critical race theory some of them stood and said that that we needed more critical thinking in our schools and what what's interesting is that's the use of logic and reason right to come to conclusions and that has that that's almost the opposite of critical theory it is in fact the opposite of critical theory uh it's funny there's even a paper that i cite very frequently by a woman named allison bailey uh, she wrote a paper and i'll try to get the entire title from memory correct but it's something along the lines of tracking privilege preserving epi epistemic pushback in uh, feminist and critical race philosophy classrooms something close to that critical race philosophy classrooms is definitely mentioned so is feminist but it's uh, the concept is privilege preserving epistemic pushback people only disagree so they can they epistemically push back they only disagree so that they can preserve their privilege and she has this paragraph in there where she says no, the critical thinking tradition, we have, to, we have to be clear about this, she says. The critical thinking tradition comes from a place of finding epistemic adequacy, soundness and validity of argument, basically knowing what you're talking about, right? Getting things right. She says, but the critical theory tradition, the critical pedagogy tradition comes from a completely different set of assumptions. And those are rooted in neo-Marxism, which are a constant analysis of power dynamics and the relevance of power dynamics to everything. So there's a game being played, a linguistic shell game being played with the word critical. We do need more critical thinking in terms of what critical thinking actually means, which is being skeptical, asking questions, not taking everything at face value, and so on. Gathering evidence, for example, in particular, epistemic adequacy, as it's framed in the philosophical literature, we do not need more critical theory style thinking. And there's a little game being played there. And if, the, you know, it's, it's helpful for me when I talk to people who are religious because this word means a lot to them or very secular people, it means less to. But what's actually needed for people who want to fight back against this is a tremendous amount of discernment because you have to figure, you have to understand that words are being used to mean two things at once. And it's very easy to fool, you know, a smart, well-meaning person, an academic dean, for example. No, 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 we do need more critical thinking. This is critical theory. That's a critical thinking tradition. Okay, but it's not. And so people who are, are discerning, who can step in and say something about that, are, are a necessary part of the ingredient. So bravo to your daughter for standing up. Yeah, I, you know, I really appreciate talking to you, I, James. I could we, we, we could go on all day, but we're kind of out of time. But uh why don't you make one more plug for your uh, for your book and your website? Okay, so the website is newdiscourses.com. What I do there is put out as much of this stuff as I can learn, as fast as I can learn it, mostly in podcast form now because it's faster. I have an encyclopedia of social justice terminology for people looking for that discernment. Uh, so you can go read how do they use words in spe specialist ways. I've probably got about 150 of them laid out there at the website. The book is coming up soon. It's called Race Marxism. And it's going to be a chronicle of how they retooled Marxist theory from class to race so that uh, we can understand this kind of 
very integral piece to the strategy that they're using to undermine America now. James, thank you, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.